Yes, hello, welcome everyone to this inaugural episode of the Battle of the Marketing Minds. Uh, my name is JP Kuhlwein and I'll be your host today. I always wanted to say that. Um, <laughs> but before we get going, actually, I was asked to give you a few housekeeping items. So I'll be very disciplined and do that first. Um, as you can see on the screen, I think, um, you should all feel encouraged to ask questions. We like questions here, so ideally we focus on yours, actually. So please support the, um, uh, submit those via the chat box that you find at the bottom uh, left of your screen. Um, there is a download to the presentation. We are going to share a few slides that you will find in the file download pod, as it is technically called. Um, you can also uh, view the video uh, in uh, full screen or the PowerPoint and uh, go back and forth with the arrows that you find on the top right of the screen. Complete a brief evaluation at the end if you can. That would be great. That's what keeps us going and motivated. Um, and then share the program. Pass it on to, the, um, uh, to your colleagues. Pass it on on social media. That's one of the things we're going to talk about today. The more, the better. So I hope uh, that works. I don't need to talk about restrooms. You're all sitting in your own places. So you know better than me where those are. Um, I think there's one more technical item I want to cover, which is the points you can get for uh, professional development, the CPE credits. Um, you can earn those, but only if you participate live. And we will have surprise questions for you and call you out by name. And only if you <laughs> respond within a few seconds, we will give you those credits. Um, so stay on the live webcast, and you will get your CPE points. And with that, um, I'm going to start uh, this session of the Battle of the Marketing Minds. Let me introduce myself first. My name is JP Kuhlwein. I come from Germany. And uh, Kuhlwein is an umlaut with a UE, as it should be. Um, I've been in marketing for longer than I want to admit, let's say two decades plus, um, mostly at Procter & Gamble, across countries, categories, beauty brands, laundry detergents, you name it. Um, I'm passionate for brand strategy. I research it. I uh, am an author on a couple of books, and I teach it brand strategy here in New York, where I live at NYU. And that's why I'm here. I'm also leading the brand new Marketing Institute of the Conference Board. And one of the fun formats we thought we should start is a so-called battle <laughs> of the expert minds. And we've got some expert minds here on opposite sides of the table, literally and figuratively. So with that, I want to introduce the subject, which is, you know, what should it be for a marketer? Should it be targeted? Um, one-on-one -on -one marketing, performance marketing, which seems to be the thing that everyone is talking about. A lot of one-on-one -on -one marketing at scale is a favorite expression. Or is there still a lot of value in more mass-targeted advertising where you don't try to go one-on-one, -on -one, but you go broad and you try to maximize penetration and reach? And we've got representatives of both points of views uh, here at the table. Let me first turn to my left, your right, Mark DiMassimo. DiMassimo. Thank Di you. Massimo, difficult names today. Founder and chief is the official title, right, of uh, DiMassimo Goldstein. Correct. Um, which, and I quote, is the world's leading brand response agency. You haven't got challenged so far on that claim, I think. No. Um, <laughs> Your website states that you are on a mission to build the leading brands of 2020, and you say they are brands that have a direct model, that change lives, that are simple and habit-forming. Did I quote that right? Yes, you did. Um, you've been in this business also for quite a while. I'll leave it up to you whether you want to admit for how long or not. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you've got a reputation for being a doer, not only a sayer, and uh, uh, building brands relationship building, going directly, activating brands and people is kind of your business. Um, Correct. And, and I've read quite a few uh, case studies about that, b dating back to the 90s, uh, where you've been quite the pioneer uh, already in brand activation. So thanks for being on our webcast. Thank you so much. Excellent. And then to my right, to your left, I have Peter Field. 
Uh, and it, it, it says very humbly on your LinkedIn profile, independent marketing and advertising professional. I like to keep a low profile. <laughs> which, uh, which I know is a British understatement, of course, because other people call you the godfather of effectiveness. Uh, yes. Um, which yes. sounds a little bit more elevated. Is it a gangster? Sounds a bit more elevated. Now, uh, you are a lot about effectiveness. Uh, it, it's your business and your belief. And I, and I read somewhere that you say over the years, um, uh, you've come to believe ever more, actually, um, that uh, it's a numbers game. It's all about trial. Mm. Um, it's the top of the funnel. Mm. And that increasing penetration through brand building is the business you should be in. There's a quality to brand building, but at the end of the day, it's a numbers game. Totally. Yeah. Wonderful. I, I love it. You, you stand firm. Um, and Les Binet, That's not what? Binet, no. unfortunately, Binet, <laughs> who is also from the UK, flew in just for us today. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> Um, and you are head of effectiveness, effectiveness, sorry, again, effectiveness, I see a theme here, at the advertising agency Adam and Eve DDB. That's right. You also run their matrix, I think it's called, um, division, which is uh, uh, about econometrics uh, and consultancy. That's there. Job. So a lot about the, the, the numbers, which is a theme in your life, I think. Yes. You did a master's in artificial intelligence. Uh, I started out as a physicist, then I was in AI, and then eventually advertising. There you go. And, and, and nevertheless, you're not that big of a fan of performance marketing, it seems, or not in um, all cases. We'll, we'll qualify that later on. I think performance marketing has a role to play, but it, it's only one aspect of what works. Uh, very good, very good. So I want to set this up. Um, uh, so, in fact, I think the, the quote here was, performance marketing tends to lead marketers astray. Yes. Um, uh, which, which is qualifying that. So with that, again, thank you, uh, gentlemen, for being here. Thank Let's you. get started with you, actually, Les. Um, and uh, I've got beautiful, I can control the slides here. Um, I quote you again, you told financial services marketers, of which we have many members uh, at a forum last year, that share of voice um, is more important than market share is probably the most important share, and that loyalty doesn't work. Mm. Um, actually, I didn't quite say that, and I wouldn't <laughs> say that. So I, I, market share is clearly more important than share of voice. Um, market, what, we, we, what we care about is sales and profit and performance of businesses. Um, share of voice is an important driver of market share. Um, so I think maybe somebody misquoted me there. Um, but share of voice is one of the things that, that, that helps to drive market share forward. But clearly, market share is what, what, what we care about. Um, the loyalty part of the quote, um, again, that's an oversimplification. Loyalty is an important driver of growth, but it's a secondary driver. Um, it's primarily penetration that drives growth. And when you get penetration growth, loyalty tends to follow. And the effects, but the effects of loyalty are smaller. Um, what, what I probably did say is that loyalty first marketing, marketing that puts loyalty as the primary aim, doesn't work. OK, that's a very good qualification. And I should say that um, you have a lot of data behind your observations. You work with the database of IPA, which yeah. is the Institute of Practitioners in Advertising in the UK, um, which has gathered data, I think, for the last almost 20 years. More than 30 years. More, more than 30, 30 years. years. Yeah. And uh, you, you, you've been in the business of kind of extracting the effectiveness data behind yes, that, exactly. which uh, yeah. I think one of your uh, reports is the eff uh, effectiveness in context, which is yes. a kind of wildly, widely read uh, uh, document there. Mark. What do you say there? Um, I know this uh, uh, triggers a reaction usually on your side, and I want to show this little, oops, no, not this picture, actually the picture of the Dollar Shave Club, because when we talked, yes, yes, um, you were talking a lot about, you know, people nowadays, um, they kind of put together their own portfolio, they're on subscription models, they buy into things uh, emotionally and physically directly, so how can this still impact them? Yeah, so I, I think the, 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 I run an advertising agency. Um, I launched my advertising agency about, back in 1996, so that's 23 years, so it gives you a sense of how long my, my career has been. Um, I launched it 
because I noticed that a certain class of client was ill-served. They were ill-served by brand agencies that didn't grow up understanding their business model, which was direct-to-consumer, uh, a growing business model. Um, and they were ill-served by performance marketing agencies that had learned their craft stealing from the brand bank accounts mm -hmm. of the companies that they worked for. So, you know, the way direct marketing grew up and what became digital marketing, performance marketing here in the U.S. is performance agencies were gifted large brands that had been built through advertising for many years. And then they used performance marketing, in a sense, to pull from those brand bank accounts using promotions. My job was to align with my clients and to say from the client's point of view, how do brand and performance come together? And so what we all agree on is that brand and performance coming together is the most important thing. I think that when I look at these findings, first off, when I first found these findings in I think it was 2013, I joined the IPA and the Marketing <laughs> Society in order to get them. I taught them to everybody you in my agency. Yeah, yeah, try. I taught them to all of my clients. Um, it was a reinforcement of what I had said. I have this article I published in 2000 called Brand Direct, where mm -hmm. I basically said, if you're firing your, your agencies in order to buy results, mm -hmm. you're not building brands. If you're not building brands, you'll lose. Yeah. But from the, from the agency point of view, from the media company point of view, this research, which is the product of marketing case studies, mm -hmm. Um, and since I've been on the other side of a lot of marketing case studies, either judging them or making them, they're like sausages. They go down a lot easier when you haven't seen how they're made. <laughs> right? Agencies create marketing case studies. I saw you at LinkedIn yesterday. Sales departments rarely create marketing case studies. Marketing departments create marketing case studies. Clients today, maybe, but historically, don't create marketing case studies. Agencies create marketing case studies. Advertising is an incredibly important lever. We agree on that too. But it's become a decreasingly important level, lever for effectiveness, for building brand mm. and for performance. Mm. It is a smaller piece of the pie. And if I look at it from my, I think agencies, and I'll, I'll conclude this part with this, mm. I think agencies love the long and the short of it. And, and, and Which is results. the title of, of, so they, of, they of help the us, it helps us, yes, yeah. It helps us yeah. sell advertising yeah. and it helps us do what we do better. Yeah. Media companies love the long and the, and the short of it. It's, as, as a practitioner, it's on me to show my client I care more about their results than I do about selling right. advertising. So, so, and that's where I have to start. So right. if I... If I get you right, what you're saying is advertising, which means a message that was created creatively uh, with a concept then transformed into an advertisement and is then being um, projected out, distributed via whatever media, whether it's YouTube or, you, or TV. You, you threw up the example of Dollar Shave Club. Right. Is, is, is getting less important. And these relationships, I'm showing a slide here of Peloton mm -hmm. with you know, a biker, you have people in, in the studio, you have thousands more outside, which is much more intimate, even though it's mass spending, are more the relationships of the future, or even the present is kind of what there's you're a saying. a business model and there's a delivery model, that the, the, and that change has been so much more important over the last decade to right. shifts in market share than advertising. I think we set up so that. So, but we've been entirely excited, and clearly this D2C kind of um, uh, model is growing, and there's very good commercial reasons why that should be the case. It doesn't alter the requirement to have a strong brand. In fact, mm. it strengthens it. What we, we've done in, in our latest publication is we've, we've, we've looked at lots of cuts, lots of new trends and new developments in the marketplace to see how they might redial the kind of rules of effectiveness. And the interesting thing about, shall we say that precisely those subscription model businesses is what we find is that the importance of a strong brand becomes even greater than it is with the yes. conventional old model. You've got to sign these people up. They're making a commitment. They're, you know, they are making a very real commitment to your business. Therefore, they need to have some real sense of confidence and draw to you. So Peter, should they have, we're showing an ad here, 
randomly. It's a Super Bowl ad. Mm, right. Probably good in effectiveness mm. uh, if it's decent, creative. But are you saying they should first build it up this way, the classic way, and think, then move to the one-on-one -on -one model? I think it's really important to make a distinction here between brand building and advertising because it's very easy to elide those two things. Mm. I think I sense we all agree that you need to build brands and you need a balance and a combination of brand building and direct Absolutely. activity at what we call activation. I think don't think we disagree there. I suspect you probably also think that brands are still as important as they were. More. More. Yeah. Right. So we think more. Oh, and, more. And, 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 and we 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 as Peter says, for example, in, in the world of subscription type products or indeed selling online direct to consumers that brand building is more important in those mm. situations. So I, I think we all agree on that. I think where we might disagree is about the word advertising. And so I think you think that advertising is less important than it used to be or maybe less less important, less effective. And then the, the next question is what do you mean by advertising when, when you say that? Can I ask you? Oh, yes, please. Uh, I, uh, this is the conversation I, w I was hoping for. Um, I think that the I think that the that the the levers. I think that there's an argument to be made, and it's an, it's extreme, and it's 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 probably beyond what I mean. But advertising as the primary lever mm -hmm. for brand building is for losers. Okay. Okay. So I, I well, first of all, I don't think that I don't think that's <laughs> ever been the the prime. I mean, the primary way you build brands is you know much bigger than that. You start with the culture of the company. You start with the design of the product. And I mean, great Apple, is, yeah. Apple, great products. Apple is a is a brand that was built to a very large extent through design, not through advertising. But I'm glad to hear you say. Okay, that. let me be very very precise. Ask a very precise question. Do you think that advertising, in the sense of Super Bowl ads, for example, works now? Um, I, I think that I think for the right advertiser at the right time, a Super Bowl ad can be game changing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I also believe in television. Mm -hmm. uh, television is the best complement right now and for the last five years or so, and probably for the next five years too, to the right sort of funnel. Mm -hmm. So I think we're on the same page about that. Um, my, my argument, uh, I, I, I might argue with you, and I'd like to learn about some, some of the conclusions of your study. What I see, and I think you're not, you're, you will soon be as well known in this country as you, as you are in the UK. I feel like I was an early adopter. And I see a lot of malpractice and, and um, misapplication of these findings. Mm -hmm. I see clients get fired every day uh, uh, based on the misapplication of these mm -hmm. findings. So my, my goal here actually is, is to is to keep people from making mistakes okay. as they employ mm -hmm. these right. Right. So if, if I can just sort of, I mean, be very specific about it. There is, a, there is a point of view, and I'm not saying you subscribe to this, but I, I hear it a lot, that, for example, television advertising doesn't work anymore. Yes. Uh, that's demonstrably false. Mm -hmm. I mean, where you've got studies, and there are studies in the UK, studies in the US, where people have measured the ROI from mm -hmm. TV advertising over time, and they all suggest that the ROI is going up. Yes. TV, TV advertising is becoming more efficient over time. Um, mm. So, and but is that also because the cost of social media has increased enormously? So, relatively speaking, yes. It's um, and actually, I tell you what, I think we I we think believe. So, what we see within our data is an indication that the effectiveness of all the basically all the advertising media has been rising over time. And we believe one of the reasons for that is quite simply, and this kind of plays to your role, I suppose, that activation has become radically more efficient these days. In the old days, can you explain what you understand? Yeah, about I, 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 activation is just driving short-term response, promotion, short -term sa sales driven. Well, classically promotion, but, yeah. but it can just be a reminder or some. And, some and, and I show a slide here. I think that you've also shown which. Uh, you say that uh, activation yeah. is usually boring, basically, from equity, uh, is low on emotion and high on a direct call it, to let, action. Let me, it doesn't let me, let me be very specific about this. In the old days, yeah. if you were 
on a on a bus or in a car and you went past a poster and that poster influenced you the chances are that by the time you got home or by the time you got to the grocery store or wherever you would buy you'd have forgotten about that poster. Mm -hmm. nowadays if you see some a poster and it and it excites you you can take your phone out and you can google it and you can probably buy right there and then so effectively all posters are now have a direct response element mm -hmm. all radio ads have a direct response element. which means all classic advertising, advertising is now linked yeah. to direct all, response. all advertising Entirely. has a direct response yes. mechanism yeah. which increases its ROI exactly it, it does and it, for the first decade of this millennium we saw a fantastic rising trend in the typical effectiveness levels of the case studies that we were looking at, as that kind of benefit started to come through. But then it all changed 10 years ago, and it all changed because people went down this very short-term, very sales activation model. They performance to, well, marketing, mostly performance marketing. marketing. I think performance marketing is a complete misnomer, yeah. because it mm -hmm. is all about short-term. It's nothing to do with maxing out performance, which requires brand in parallel. So, so many businesses have been seduced by this model now, what we are seeing is a total and unending decline in the kind of effectiveness level. So if we're looking at these it's Peloton really people here uh, working out, in your mm. mind, this I, is I'm not, not performance market. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm not at all familiar with what this is. So, um, so that's a good explanation. basically, they are selling a, a workout bike. Okay. okay. They're selling it to your home. And then they have studios where you can go and you can have a workout with them on this okay. bike, okay. Peloton brand. Yeah. Yeah. But more importantly, they project this yeah. via TV yeah. out yeah. and everyone okay. on their bike sees it. Yeah. This is a brand building relationship. Uh, undoubtedly, we get, we've got this campaign quite strongly in the UK. At the moment. They are clearly trying to build a brand. There's no question about that. And that's a very sensible thing to right. do. With, um, but I guess your, your, your challenge is that's fine for a brand like this is an upscale bike they're probably good with selling a couple of hundred then a couple of thousand but once you get into the burger king uh kind of arena that mm -hmm. might not work anymore is that no, the no, finding no we're not saying that in the uk or let's take a competitor there's mcdonald's mcdonald's case study really strongly illustrates the importance of investing in brand and they use many media they use tv they use uh, digital they use all sorts of traditional out of door media but their success in the, over the last 10 years since the um, uh, Super Size Me scandal was absolutely dependent upon strengthening their investment in brand building. They had gone down the route that many, many businesses have gone down around the world, which is say, let's just do the short term piece. You know, let's just do the 99 cent you know, burger, whatever it is, we'll just do that. And it kind of keeps everyone coming in through the doors. What it doesn't do is drive year-on-year -year growth, and that's what these guys needed to do. So about 10 years ago, they rebalanced their budget. They shifted from 100% activation, short-term sales yeah. stuff, to a much more appropriately balanced uh, kind right. of uh, distribution right. between brand and activation. Right. And you know, the growth has come through. You know, it's, it's in many ways old-fashioned old thinking, but it's still valid and it still works. And my understanding, Mark, is you would say it is old-fashioned indeed, because I think every activation should also be brand building and can be i, I think uh, i think one has to uh, has to put it in the context of the lens and I, I i view it as i mean with all respect we agree about what you said about brand and you know when we op when we opened up about it but i i think it is primarily an advertising lens and the truth is that um that there are many clients out there who are spending 100% of their money just to make the revenue that they need this month, yeah, yeah, and yet still need yeah. to build a brand. Yeah. And yeah. so to not, uh, and I'm sure you do as practitioners, yeah. to not talk to them about the other levers. For example, our client Netflix, they, um, you know, they managed to spend maybe 20 years on the early part of your of the curve you showed yesterday, yesterday. right? The curve. Why did they do that? Because they continually reinvested in reinventing their business model, and then they built their brand primarily through the content. Yeah. Yeah. And they were, they, they were very cherry with their advertising dollar, and rightly so. Does that mean advertising can't work really well for them? It does, and now they spend a lot of money on advertising, but it's mostly performance. 
because the brand is built through and that's the not, experience. That's not, so that's not true. In this, actually, it's not even true um, okay. because um, they're spending a lot of money on. I mean, you can't move for Netflix posters in 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 London. Yeah, if, no, absolutely. Yeah, many many of these yeah. these these kinds of tech startup businesses in the early stages of their development, they don't need advertising. They've got a radically new product. They've got a new business model. They've got stuff that excites people and draws them in. I can promise you that they will, in time, move to a much higher level of investment because they're getting in-kind competitors increasingly matching them. They will find, as they are already doing yeah, so... The easy growth has gone. The easy growth yes. they need to get back into the business of we, we know this will happen because it's happening with Amazon, for instance. Sure, sure. In the run-up to Christmas in the UK, Amazon was an enormous spender across... In the US as well. Brand, sure. And in the US. Second biggest... Uh, and this was the TV business that, you know, probably five years ago, we said these guys don't need advertising. Yes. They do in time. And that's the so way it's like it. Viagra, as long as you're the only kid on the block and the brand new technology, you don't need advertising. <laughs> the word of mouth will do it. If only I brought the same pleasure. Right, right, right. right, 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 right. Yeah. Uh, then with Cialis, you get yeah. into differentiation, you need advertising. Yeah. Now, um, so I mean, a lot, of our, a lot of our observations about effectiveness are, are really very context specific. So, you know, I think we, we find a lot of agreement with. In yeah. but they're in specific situations um, and we all have to be wary of the simplified the, the oversimplistic kind of view that because a particular business in a particular situation has had great success in a particular strategy that that automatically must apply to everyone and that's where we get into a lot of danger right. Right. I, mean, I think i think you, we think clearly you, we, we, we agree much more than we disagree um, unfortunately for you because you're let's give you something else so it's actually triggered by a conversation we had yesterday yeah. and you said you know jp Nobody's interested by the frosting on the cake, right? I think I said let me let me finish. Okay, go on, let so me misquote you first, then you can correct <laughs> <laughs> me. Nobody's interested by the frosting in the cake, yeah. so that's why I put this wonderful slide together. Thank you. Yes, it's beautiful. Oh, yes. um, right. And uh, you know, but everyone's interested joining Weight Watchers. It's it's a very you know relationship. It's a very interactive, participatory kind of activity, and relationship is where the brand building, where the fuel, where the word of mouth creation is. But the question, I guess, is what do you do if you are Betty Crocker and you do have frosting to sell? You know, uh, what's the icing on the cake? No pun yeah. intended. When you do that, isn't it more the classic advertising, or should you look for how do I create a purpose that engages people emotionally so they send me emails or you know social media uh, messages back and forth? Great question. I, yeah, I think I think what I said was people don't want a deep and meaningful relationship with their frosting. And so I was agree. So there we there we there we agree, right? Um, and um, and I think I, you know I further said that that if your product is a commodity differentiated in it, it to 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 any meaningful degree only by its brand, and people are walking around out in the world using advertising to build mental availability so that when they walk down that aisle, there's a better chance that they'll mm -hmm. choose it, is the right advertising method for you with some modern add-ons in the store maybe. Um, mm -hmm. That is a, an increasingly marginalized situation in this world. Most advertisers make the mistake of misapplying the formulas they learned in different contexts to the new context they're in. So for example, during the same time that Wyden and Kennedy, a great advertising agency, was reviving the fortunes of Old Spice with their man, your man, mm -hmm. uh, could smell like campaign, they were getting the president and head of marketing of Weight Watchers fired with a campaign on the theory that we must first build brands and in a multi-screen environment, people will be able to click and respond right away. She, she will tell you, she said, I'm not going to mention her name here uh, because it's for her to, to so she, she would out herself, but, but I'm not going to do it to her. But she said, you know, I loved it so much. I took the additional million dollars that I could have spent on performance marketing and, and I spent it on it and, it and results went down. Yeah. Yeah. We were hired well, as that's the next agency. Dumb, isn't it? <laughs> it's clearly done. That, and that's how, a, that's how a good agency in the United States applies or misapplies yes, these. There is a really important learning from that, which I hope she, she, she shares with people, 
which is that if you move too fast, and you know, I think I still would support what she was trying to do. I think it was the right uh, goal. I suspect she moved too fast. I suspect she pulled too much money out of performance marketing too quickly. Because what, of course, happens as you divert budget from performance marketing, so-called short-term uh, spend, into long-term brand building, you're turning off a short-term tap, which immediately mm -hmm. reduces the flow of business, mm -hmm. in order to turn on a tap for long-term growth, which we know is going to take at least two quarters to come good. Now, you have to have a strategy to ensure you're still in a job two quarters later. And I suspect, probably increasingly around the world, nobody's going to give you two quarters. You've got to have a strategy to manage that transition from pure short-term time. And I, you know, I think, again, we are all in violent agreement on this, that it was the implementation rather than perhaps the intended destination that was right. right. Um, yeah. well, let, 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 let's talk about implementation. I mean, one of the difficulties I find is that this direct-to-consumer relationship, um, you cho showed me some viral videos that you, you just uh, produced, etc., cetera, um, is being measured by the likes and the retweets and the clicks and so on. Uh, but if you read some people, Bob Hoffman is a is an interesting fella in really the West. Really, love Hoffman. Really love, but I, I I believe it. He doesn't throw um, any punches. Um, basically, comes up with reams and reams of data, mostly not himself, mm. but just by studying different research, mm. including you know journalists, MIT, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, basically, says an ever increasing amount of this data is fake. They're click farms. Mm. Uh, they're fake websites, yeah. accounts, etc. Do you take that into account, by the way, when you look at your ROIs? Uh, that possibly, uh, I, I, I mean, he quotes we 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 uh, 19, <laughs> just, just to give you a flavor, nineteen percent of TV impressions that are uh, over the top um, um, are are okay. invalid. So five hundred million fraud. In the data we, we work with, accounts. we will never work with that kind of fluffy level of data. The only ROI we're interested in, is money. to say, is money. How much profit? generate right. a unit of investment. Then Mark, how do you deal on your side when you go to the clients and say, you know, we got two million clicks again, um, how, how, do you, how do you get your measure? How do you substantiate it? Yeah, the, the answer for us is process-oriented is process and, and, and structure, it's alignment. The truth is that Bob doesn't pull his uh, punches, but, but everything I've read underestimates the fraud Mm. And uh, that I've seen, it's it is it is massive. Uh, the 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 it's 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 an endemic problem, and there is no great systematic solution right now. Uh, this is why we have believed very strongly in the integrated agency model. You know, a bit, I think I feel a big mistake in the industry has been separating the creative agency from the media agency. The and separating the performance mm. from the brand building on the agency side Agreed. because the client is responsible for all of it. And when you, as the agency, are accountable for all the same things your client is, mm. then you have got to find ways to make sure that the interim measures don't divert you from focusing on the bottom line. Yes. We end up both focused on the bottom line. Yeah. Yep. I do it procedurally because you know my job is to make it work in action for for clients, right? Yeah, but I entirely support that point of view. I think it makes great sense. He's daft to have these siloed thinking, siloed structures. I mean, it makes no sense. There's but another issue, which is you know people get obsessed about the bots and the the fact that the digital numbers are inflated, but actually, even if you take the digital numbers at, at face value. If you put them in the proper context, you realize how small many of them are. Right. So, for example, if you look at the, a brand like Coca-Cola and you look at what percentage of users of Coca-Cola ever visit their Facebook page or interact with them on social media, it comes out at about 0.1%. And then, if you look at that 0.1% and say, of those, how many of them actively engage on mm. a regular basis with Coca-Cola and social media is about 0.1% of the 0.1%. In other words, it's not. I was going to use a swear word. Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry, yeah. But, you know, it's nothing. It's so nothing. we're looking at a chart from from the long and the short that we've talked yeah. uh, mm. about a lot, and and uh, I think you can. It's a it's a funnel, but in the, not in the classic sense. Not in the sense of no, no. you want to build this broad. Yeah. Brand awareness. Yeah. Yeah. You want to build the broad equity, and you yeah. want to reach as many people as possible. It's, it's really important that you start priming people to want your brand long before they come to buy. 
Um, you used an analogy right at the beginning of the of the session where you talked about um, people um, withdrawing from the brand bank. You know, yes, you've got to yeah. build up assets in the bank before you can take them out. But and what if, I, can, if I can use yeah. another analogy, which I think is, uh, which I think this is Mark Ritson has used this one, but the idea that you have to you have to water and grow the tree before you can harvest the fruit. And the process of, of watering and growing the tree is much longer than the harvesting. It takes you years to grow an apple tree, and it takes years of watering. The harvesting yeah. is over in, yeah. in, a, in, a, in a month right. or something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But what, 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 about, what about the existing customers that are at the bottom here, and they're yeah, very well, small? We, uh, there are a lot of brands that swear by their loyal customers. They say yes. They're the ones that yeah. give me monetary money, yeah. but also yeah. they give me word of mouth. They yeah. give me they authentication they of my brand. It's, 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 it, but yeah, so it, it, it is uh, talking to and serving your existing customers is always important. Although what I would, I would say actually is the primary way you do that is not through marketing and communications at all. Is through customer service. Mm. Um, the idea, I, I hate the term CRM, customer relationship management. You don't manage relationships. You know, I don't manage the relationship with my wife. You, it's a <laughs> two way. <laughs> but, 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 but that's all very well. But, but actually, the primary job of marketing is to go much broader than that, to talk mm. about, not to your yeah, but, but I'm, but Mark, 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 sorry, but aren't they? people in your campaigns that are very important as influencers, as people you pass on the information first because you know they will spread it um, as inspiration for the campaign, etc. Or do you also say, no, loyal consumers, low value? I, I mean, unless... I'm not saying they're low well, value. Well, well they're it's, very important. It's, 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 it's the question is, can you drive growth through them? And it's, it is not impossible, but it's difficult to drive them. scale growth through using our existing customers as advocates. And, and, and is, it, is, it, is it? I, I just... I, I you agree on that I, point? Uh, I, there, are, there are many qualifiers that turn out to be, in practice, more important, Yes, mm -hmm. is, is, is my point. And I think so. a lot of these are givens. A lot of what you've put forward are correctives for the way people were, mm -hmm. uh, you know, were and are dealing with these things. Um, but one, I mean, again, there's a there's a world of difference between a frosting and a retirement home. Mm -hmm. You know, Agreed. where you're going to spend the rest Agreed. of your life, right? Agreed. There's a world of difference uh, um, between um, uh, Blockbuster and Netflix, right? I mean, I think Blockbuster built brands; they promoted the hell out of it. I say that, mm -hmm. and um, and and yet business model uh, changed. There are certain categories: education, uh, mm -hmm. where I'm going to live, what organization I join, financial services. Although uh, financial services act like commodities too in many ways, and we mm -hmm. we can talk about that. There are many categories in which no decision happens without passing through the social net. Of referrals, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I've got a good friend. He's also uh, yeah. a, a, a data yeah. analytics econometrics econo guy named Tony Boda, mm -hmm. who has shown in the hospitality category that it's not worth advertising any feature that you don't get five star reviews for. Just mm -hmm. not worth it. Mm -hmm. And so to step back and say, do we have something worth advertising, has become a much more important gate than it uh, used to be. Right. Well, uh, I think you're, all, you're already, I think, uh, talking about a particular type of advertising. You're talking about features. Now, great brand advertising is not about communicating product features. It's about creating an emotional buy-in to a business. And you know, I would argue that that is extremely important where you are using existing customers to provide referral and support. Because essentially, you are giving them a kind of emotional uh, backdrop and reinforcement. And the reason why uh, great brands and great brand building advertising is based on emotions. It's because once you do this emotional priming that Les was just talking about, getting people to buy into it, they believe all the good stuff. You don't have to go through the detailed performance product. You don't have to decide, is that five star or four star? Oh my God, can we advertise it? You just give them this fantastic emotional reason to buy into the brand and the rest comes off the back um, of it. 
I mean, um, if you yeah. can do that, you screw up by not I, delivering. I'd love to respond to that. I mean, no, 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 there are just so many things I want to say. But we, we, no, let's we, have we, my... Shut up. First off, far away, far away. First off, far away, far away. First off amen mm. about what great great brand advertising is. It's a, it, it is it is emotional and it does all the things that you said that it does. Again, I I I think when you view when you talk about features or benefits. In the context of advertising, you're absolutely right. When you talk about features or benefits of the product in the context of mm -hmm. levers to build the brand, you're potentially misleading. Because, for example, when Warby Parker figures out that letting people try the frames at home mm -hmm. can mm -hmm. revolutionize mm -hmm. their business, they are doing something so emotional. I mean, glasses. Mm -hmm. It's like frosting, okay? Mm -hmm. They did something so emotional for the target audience that it was better than any advertising they could do mm -hmm. at that mm -hmm. point. It gave them a platform okay. upon okay. which their advertising worked. Fine. 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 Let me ask you, what have their competitors done in response to this? What have their competitors done in response to this? Well, well I'm, I'm, they've, no, I'm bad. They've, they've done exactly this. Well, they have competitors like they have competitors like like Harry's, which sort of have have, have, mm. have followed. Uh, no, I'm sorry, that's I'm I'm, I'm in dollar yeah. okay. <laughs> Sorry. Mm. Um, see, more than 23 years. Um, <laughs> you know, their com their competitors were much like the situation that Gillette was in. Okay, it's an unfair so, question. So sure. Gillette yeah. built yeah. brand yeah. with brand yeah. advertising, mm. uh, and Gillette was on the shelf, but Dollar Shave Club saw this mm. that, that 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 they they were unguarded on the direct flank mm. and they recreated the proposition right. Right? so so so, so, so Mark is saying well they will eat everyone's breakfast the, yeah. the in kind competition well, they is already have, yeah. coming. You've got Harry's coming alongside Dollar Shave. They will all go and at that And you say point, then they will come to advertise. Then they will need a brand to get the buy in. But I think this is a so they 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 also to, to, if they haven't done anything in the meantime, they have squandered Yes. That opportunity, when they were the first mover, when everyone was looking at them, if they didn't build the brand then, when they didn't need to, but if they didn't do it then, then they missed a golden opportunity. Well, and many do. And do. We, 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 we yes. heard one, one which is some of the activation, if, if you want to call it that way, is very emotional and can build brand equity. Yeah. And there really is another, another, so okay. okay. there is another, there is another, um, um, concern that I hear a lot uh, uh, from smaller brands that read your your findings, which is, it's all very well. I would love to have a Super Bowl ad, or I would love mm. to do broad mass advertising, yeah, but I can simply do not afford. We're not saying you yeah, have to do. We're not saying you have to do. So Super Bowl. What, what, what they suck? So, not everyone. Can so advertising is only for the big guys. No. no. no, no, no. And what you say, you, And what do you what do you say about the phenomenon that a lot of the biggest brands today is in, in, in industries um, actually have grown up never spending a buck on advertising. Um, I don't know, Patagonia, Glossier, there, there are many that say, you know, the, the, the only yeah. ad we ever placed, Patagonia, yeah. is yeah. in a newspaper and it says don't buy our product. Yeah. Yeah. How do you explain this phenomenon? Yeah. Might there be an alternative to yeah, well, look, advertising? Pa Patagonia is, is a good example of a purpose brand yeah. and they are putting some skin in the game, unlike most people who uh, right. try and hijack purpose. These guys are putting, I think, a percent of their profits in. So they, yeah. they're, not, they're not BSing here. They're okay. really doing So that's they are authentically brand. purpose, yeah. and they spread the news yeah. through that, and you say that's brand equity, and it's valid. Yes. Let, let's then, I'm, well, let's then take a startup that is more of a digital native, mm. like a Glossier or... Um, mm. Uh, help me here, Harry's, etc. We talked about which, this yeah. at the presentation yeah. yesterday. So mm. it is well known that you can gain strong growth when you're a startup without advertising um, through a combination of physical availability, just basically getting get, being out there, being available to buy, through word of mouth, through copying, all the things we talked about. We don't deny that those exist, and they could be powerful forces in the beginning. But what we know is that that initial sort of, if you like, the free growth doesn't last forever. Yeah. And we know yeah. that it slows down. Yeah. And we even have an equation which shows how it slows down. Yeah. And what happens is those brands eventually hit the buffer. So, they reach, so there's an equation called the, 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 um, the Bass Diffusion Model, which right. we've known about since the 1960s, that tells you what happens to these brands. They all reach an inflection point where 
they have to do something else. And this is what's happening to all the Ubers and Amazons and Netflix of, of the world. They, they eventually reach a point where the easy growth is gone mm. and then they have to do something mm. else. And eventually that ends up being advertising. Mm. Right. Okay. Um, I won't be surprised I, to hear. I think there's another part of the story, though. Mm -hmm. right. Which part? Uh, which story? Uh, of, 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 this, of, right. of this curve, which is that, which is that um, the beginning isn't just, isn't, it isn't written that the beginning is the only beginning. There, there have been many brands that create for themselves through innovation, through adaptation, New beginnings, yes. right, yes. and restart yes. the curve. Yeah. And in yeah. fact, there's a there's a Harvard Business Review article, which I think will be in the end uh, packet, wherein you'll see that Apple, for example, spent a lot on advertising yeah, yeah, yeah. until the early '90s, mm. and and has increasingly spent on R and D, mm. while advertising as a portion of their overall revenue yeah. has yeah. stayed has stayed flat. Yeah. So there are a lot of companies that are that are investing in R and D in order to to recreate yes. those startup conditions, and I think that that's a reasonable way to go if you can. If you can, I agree. If, 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 just, yes. and in a sense, that's, <laughs> but it's not less certain than just. So, a just, just on if, so to me, it's. Uh, I mean, to some extent, it is about how strong of a brand you are internally in terms of what your product delivers, mm. what your organization stands for. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what your declared purpose is versus what your actions are. Yeah. Thinking yeah. of Patagonia, the stronger a brand you are from those holistic criteria, the more you have a choice actually how to go yeah. about let mm. it be known. Yeah. Whether you activate evangelists yeah. or fans or go through word of mouth or alternative media yeah. or any screen choice. Mm. Um, uh, or, or whether uh, a classic ad makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, I had one person joke, uh, you know, it seems like you need to be uh, an old person, 55 plus, uh, you know, for TV ads because it's all about geriatric care, etc., etc. No one else is watching CNBC anymore, etc. So I guess you need to choose carefully there. Um, I want to just make sure that uh, people are submitting their questions. I might be technically impaired here in scrolling through some, them, yeah. but I do see um, I do see some here. So um, we had one. It's an interesting question from uh, Ivan Polar, who I know is the CMO oh, yeah. at. Yeah at um, uh, General Mills, and he says, what do you think the difference is between being a brand and appearing to be a brand, i.e. building up over years like Coke has done versus, you know, um, uh, buy, which seems to be this overnight uh, uh, success. So, what, well, buy? Buy, yeah. Or what is pomegranate, buying? isn't it? Yeah, right, right, yeah. right. right. Yeah. Yeah. But look, I mean, the, the, the the difference, I guess, between the two, if I'm understanding this correctly, is to do with the depth and the sense in which the brand is ingrained in the in in you know, in, in the in the audience, you know, in the in the, in the market it's operated. Um, and the longer you've been out there, the more you've ingrained these values, the more unshakable you are. Um, what we know, one of the big things that Les and I talk about is the difference between short and long term effectiveness. And you can appear to create all sorts of things in the short right. term. But what, what we increasingly find is that if you don't show it up, if you don't show it up, if you don't keep it in market for long enough, it, it evaporates very quickly. But wouldn't there be people like Mark saying showing it up is more about your actions rather than a continued period of advertising, Mark? Not for Coke. Okay. Not for Coke. You know, because Coke, it's the icing again, it's the frosting. Coke's the frosting. You know, Coke, okay. Coke is uh, Pepsi. And Pepsi's John Scully before he went to Apple to prove that yeah. the product really mattered. At at, uh, at Pepsi, he proved that the brand was more important than the taste because because mm. he did the Pepsi yeah. challenge. More people liked the taste of Pepsi than they did of Coke, and he proved it to them. And Coke remains no. the leading yeah. soft drink, right? That's so that shows yeah, yeah. brand matters more yeah. than product mm. taste for that kind of product. Mm. Okay. So okay. when it comes to packaged goods products, we're we're in violent agreement. Yeah. Uh, it's it's the fact that most of the advertising world is not but, about, uh, and both, most no, of the brand building world sure. is not about packaged goods anymore. But, but the, 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 the critical characteristic of packaged goods, which is actually much more prevalent, um, is that it's to do with genuine differentiation. And if, when you do have genuine and radical differentiation, a radical new product, then yes, of course, we accept that the product and the inherent virtues 
can do a lot to drive growth. But these things tend to be very short-lived. This is a viciously okay. competitive and you still to keep driving growth when your competitors issue, you know, re release them. Just in answer to your original question about those two brands, um, I've only heard of one of them, so clearly one of them's a brand and the other one's not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, true brand, no, yeah. everybody knows, but they don't just know it, they right. know all about know it. it. Yeah. It's, right. it's ingrained in our brain. Right. And another, another uh, uh, question from the audience is here. How are social media influencers affecting today's brands? Not oh much. My, okay, it's here we go. Is the answer. Not much. Yeah. Um, uh, there, uh, there are areas, again, it's, it, it's, it's hard to, to, to generalize too much because uh, there are different media and different techniques associated that are appropriate for different brands in different situations. There's no one size fits all. But, but uh, so for example, if you are marketing to 12 year old girls, then influencers are quite important because they watch a lot of that sort of stuff on YouTube and they, they follow those people very closely. Um, but for example, if you are selling, let's say, cars, not so much. Um, and, and that is, you, you conclude from the data you have, or is that just insight into being a car you, purchaser you, you, yourself? You just, you know, you just have to look at how the numbers stack up, yeah, you know. Yeah. I, I think sometimes um, people find it hard to understand. Right at the beginning, we talked about how marketing is a numbers game. The kinds of numbers you need to get to move the dial in marketing. Right. So, for example, we work on uh, the John Lewis advertising. Um, and we use online video, and it's online video is John Lou is a retailer. So we use a combination of um, online video and television. And online video is it's fantastic. It, it last, in 2016, for example, we got about 70 million views online. These guys video. crashed the Facebook yeah. server. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. many people share. There's only about 100,000 of those. But what, <laughs> what people don't realize is that 70 million is a small number in market. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the television advertising got 800 million views. That's the scale of numbers that you need to move yeah. the dial in marketing. Yeah. But so there's not 800 it, million people buying at John Lewis, views. so might not a view from an influencer be worth 20 views on TV? Well, the point is, okay, let's, yeah, let's assume that, that influencer views are 20 times more valuable than TV views. But the point is that an influencer that gets a million views uh, versus a TV ad that gets 800 million views, that 20 times efficiency is not enough. Okay. Mark, do you agree with this? Um, are influencers basically useless unless you're no, a not, No, I did no, not no, say that. that. They're, they're <laughs> useless. They just can't scale uh, in the uh, same uh, way. Unless you target any what, I'm say, what I'm trying to say is that, that, that in marketing, what matters first is eff effectiveness, which is primarily driven by scale. Right. Efficiency is a secondary consideration. And that yeah. influencer marketing in many situations cannot deliver the scale that is required to deliver the size of profit yeah. that you need. But it probably looks very efficient. It's probably much lower cost, almost certainly, right. despite the kinds of sums of money that sometimes trade right. with these. It's probably a whole lot cheaper. So essentially what you're doing is you're saying, well, we've got this very low cost route to generate five small numbers. numbers. So what you're saying is by the you, 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 you would max out right. earlier and then you yeah. need to find something yeah. else to top up so the way to you actually reach so your penetration. So the goal. way yeah, yeah. to use that kind of stuff is is to amplify efficiency, not as a, as a key okay, So we've, we've, we've yes, right, we, we should let you uh, respond. Uh, yeah. with, I'm sure yeah. I talk, talk long, long quite a bit. Um, yeah, I, 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 as predictable, I have, a, I have a different point of view. Uh, but first off, I just want to say the John Lewis campaign is is uh, beautiful, and you know, frankly, if everyone out there just did it the way uh, Adam and Eve DDB does it, then there'd be no worries, and we, we this would just be a nice chat, I think, yeah. because uh, because uh, you guys do it really, really well, um, and really, I mean, one of the great advertising agencies in the world. Um, I think the problem with inter influencers is like the problem with CRM and the problem with loyalty. When marketers say it, it doesn't mean what it really is. Mm, it yes. often means the well, opposite of what absolutely. it is. Mm. That's a new dynamic. I, I there, you know, it's we, we, we talk about 
Um, I deal with a lot of the exceptions. I was an entrepreneur before I was uh, an ad guy. I've been an ad guy for a long time, but I, but I was an entrepreneur first. And um, you know, a lot of a lot of your findings give guidelines based on averages. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah. and you're you know you you want to be above the mean you want to be below the mean and in the mean case it's absolutely relevant particularly where advertising is important and everybody out there should have a head of effectiveness at their agency <laughs> and if you don't get a new agency so so we're all together on that but a true influencer a true brand lover. For a category uh, other than frosting, okay, yeah. a true brand lover in a category where another person's passion could make all the difference. I mean, frankly, Apple built it through advertising mm -hmm. in in those first years, but it saved that company. Microsoft failed through all their advertising and all they did to build that love to the point where they right. were in the position that right. Facebook is in now. Right. Right. So, so love uh, matters a lot. It's more than twenty times, but it's not what marketers call so influence. Right. You, you need to know your brand. You need to know your audience. You need to know your objectives. And there's not one recommendation for all. And influencers yeah. can be extremely valuable. If they're not but part of the brand, your own obsession yes. with the influencers is it's a very, it's a very trendy thing. But I think, yeah. like so many of these things, there's already the, the storm clouds on the horizon with right. influencers, and about uh, just how trusted uh, they are. Excellent. And where is that going to go? So we only have one great. more minute before we need oh. to start closing. But I wanted okay. to get one more question in. It's an interesting one here from Sharon, which, uh, who says, um, once you're an established brand and you've got loyal mm -hmm. users, uh, does it mean, is it okay then to reduce your advertising um, or do you need to keep it at the same level in order to maintain what you're talking okay, about? Okay, so um, established brands do need to keep spending money on advertising. You know, it's like, as somebody once said, it's like when you're a in a plane, you don't just use the engines to get you up there, they keep you up there. So the main job for most advertising is actually to maintain sales and margins and prices and profits high. So that's the first thing. You do need to keep spending. And if you don't, then sooner or later your sales and profits and margins and prices will start to mm. decline. However, if you've really invested well and you've built a really strong brand and you've got big, you actually get economies of scale. Mm. So the, the, the biggest, most successful advertisers actually can spend less relative yeah. to their yeah. size. So the aircraft analogy is perfect. You need a lot of power to get you mm. up there. Once you make it big, you can throttle back and you yeah. can keep... keep, keep uh, Mark, if I understood you right from a conversation earlier, you would say, but you don't need to fly a huge Boeing 747. <laughs> you can actually get by with a quite small marketing budget and still make a big impact. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I think we... Uh, I, I had mentioned our, our work for, for Shutterstock, uh, right. where, where viral, viral video... Uh, you know, this is a very performance-oriented uh, client and marketplace. You could say, what, what's more commoditized than stock? Mm. So we had a brand idea, which is it's not stock, it's shutter stock. Um, there are things that are better mm. about the service, but we don't talk about them much. Uh, we use um, we use video that is that has gone viral, and we've and our numbers are. I mean, you add our four yeah. recent videos yeah. together, yeah. maybe it's 25 million. It's not even seven. And I really applaud that. And I think when you see that kind of approach done, well, there's no doubt about it. You can build great growth and you can do it very cost-effectively. The observation we make, though, is that even a great agency like yours just can't guarantee to deliver this month in, month out. When you do it, you know the angels start singing, the bells start ringing. You've got to have a strategy <laughs> that can carry you through the inevitable. And you need to fuel yes. the fire. Yes. And, and you need to fuel the, the fire. And actually, the, the Shutterstock problem. example, I mean, the, the biggest thing that you need to think about is not the absolute size of your budget, but the, sh the size of your budget relative to your competitors. Really? Yes. And that's working in a category yeah. where probably that kind of spend yeah. will buy decent yeah. share of oil. Yeah, I, mean, I love these, these kind of examples of campaigns that have created very significant sales impacts and all of the other benefits we talk through really kind of viral brilliance, you creative brilliance, we know you can do it. 
it's just damn difficult, you know, if we could. Yeah. Uh, actually, gentlemen, I, 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 I need to interrupt. I, I love it that actually we were able not to compromise on yeah, everything. Yeah. 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 everything in the end. Mark, so I, 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 know, I think he's a great agency, and I know I knew we would find common I, 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 I'm excited. I'm excited. We had a good, we good conversation. I mean, at the end of the day, what I take away is that the most important thing is to understand your brand, to understand the people who might be interested in, and then to choose the right tools, to be aware of the objectives mm -hmm. and of the numbers, and that there's brand way out every time you just sell versus seduce. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, and I think we all agree on that. And then there might be different tools and different approaches uh, um, that uh, can create quite spectacular results. Um, thanks a lot for all of that. Uh, I, I need to do some housekeeping uh, uh, before we go, so let, let me go into that uh, and say there um, are uh, there is an upcoming webcast by the conference board um, uh, by the Marketing and Communication Center that is all about consumer trends. So here we are, right on target. So how do you understand your consumers and how can companies leverage those? Uh, that will be hosted by Denise Dahlhoff here at the conference board. And we also have a marketing and communications award uh, coming up, sponsored by Procter & Gamble, Alma Mata, the, the New York Times, and, and, and the Mayo Clinic. Um, um, so we hope to see you all there. Gentlemen, I want to thank you again thank for you. this thank heated you. but very uh, interesting discussions. We have links to your websites and to your publications online. You can download that as we saw before. Please give us a little rating and review to let us know how it was going. Uh, that's what keeps us going. <laughs> bye bye. Tschüss. Auf Wiedersehen. Au revoir. <laughs> I heard we need to. We need to be quiet now. Quiet. Very quiet. Hello.